mobile networks you are using phone you are calling also you are using data also so you are using mobile networks if i talk about today there are around 8.1 billion mobile subscription let me give you an idea indians they are 1.38 billion chinese they are 1.4 billion now as you these are the biggest countries means biggest populated countries so 8.1 billion mobile or our world in 2027 it is assumed that is go up to 8.9 billion and 92% will be for mobile broadband let me take you to 2018 the mobile internet traffic became more than half of global online traffic so this is the present scenario of mobile network you see china china mobile jio airtel china unicom and we have verizon at&t bsnl go to european countries or mexico but the architecture of the mobile phone network is quite different from internet because in internet we saw that we have different tier tier 1 like the main transit providers like level 3 and uh, others tier 2 isps tier 3 like this but the architecture of uh, mobile phone network has changed how it is changed the names have changed from 1g till 5g so this picture you see is a very simplified version of the fourth generation long term evolution architecture we will talk about uh, the various generation but now here we will concentrate on the present scenario okay so first there is the e u tran this is evolved umts terrestrial radio access network remember ran we'll be talking about this radio access network the radio communication protocol that is used over the air between the mobile device that is this is your cell phone okay this is your cell phone and this is your cellular base station and there is air this is a radio communication protocol and this is called the base station is now called as e node b the cellular base station you we used to traditionally call now we call them as e node b and now the cellular phone network is no longer called it is actually called as umts universal mobile telecommunication system when 3g came we started talking about umts now it is the formal name for the cellular phone network and the air interface i talked about this is based on cdma score division multiple access we'll talk about this in detail now all this picture shows different parts the cellular base station along with all the controllers this forms ran this ran radio access network okay you can also say that this is the wireless side of the mobile phone network this is wireless you know you are talking wirelessly and the controller node or you can say the rnc radio network controller this will control how the different spectrums will be used the base station is all about implementing the air interface it is it will be implementing the air interface the rest of uh, the mobile network phone network is called the core network what is the work it carries the traffic for the radio access network this is the core network so radio access network rnc core network this is the architecture then if you see 4g networks the core network has now become package switched that is data in simple terms and this is now called as epc evolved packet core epc the 3g umts core network this has come from where it has evolved from core network which was used in the earliest 2g and means second generation uh, global system mobile system the 4g epc that is evolved packet core completed the transition to a fully packet switch core network the 5g is fully digital it's fully digital so data services is now the most important part of phone network when 1g came it was all about voice 
no one has thought data will come earlier earlier the gprs systems in the gsm systems now it has all changed now previously we used to talk about kbps speeds now we are talking about only gbs gbps speed kilobit per second now it's gigabit per second kilo and giga has lot of difference kilo is 10 to the power 3 now the uh, actual scenario what happens when the user is moving out of the range of say one cellular base station because every cellular base station has a has a range now when it is moving from one base station to another base station or you can say e node b to another e node b there has to be some hand over hand off because if some call is going or the data connection is happening then how to how to uh, be connected so there has to be some swift and proper handover and handoff should be there as you see in the picture that is in order to shift from one base station to another what will happen for example you are talking you are talking to your home and you have changed the base station so either the mobile device or the base station because of the signal quality is dropping both may request a handover that oh, okay the signal is dropping we need some handover so the boundary has changed so cell networks which is based on the code division multiple access technology now it is possible to connect new before disconnecting the old base station that is rather than disconnecting from one base station it can connect to the next base station without disconnecting what i am trying to say, uh, say here that the connection quality there will be no break in service and the mobile is actually connected for a very short while to both the base stations one one base station the quality is low the other will also be low but it will peak so this handover is called soft handover soft handover the mobile is actually connected to two base station for a short while and there will be no break break in service and it will improve the connection quality there is hard handover in which the mobile has to disconnect from old base station and then only it can connect to the new base station this is called as hard handover now how to find a mobile when there is an incoming call this question should come into our mind so for that there is provision each mobile phone network has hss home subscriber server home subscriber server in the core network and what it is doing it knows the location of each subscriber and the profile information that is all the you know uh, authentication authorization name all the scenario so this hss will answer this question hss home subscriber server phone companies has to take the security very seriously first of all you are paying to them and uh, they are charging that is how they work and any kind of payment fraud has to be has to be taken care so security they are they have to put this is sim card you are very familiar with this sim card but starting with the 2g gsm system the mobile system was divided into two parts one is your handset and then you put a sim card this is a removable chip it is an electronic chip and it has the subscriber identity and the subscriber account information and this chip is called as sim card sim so subscriber identity module subscriber identity module now what you do you take one mobile put sim if you take another mobile take this sim sim put it inside another sim right and this is also providing a basis for security people can you know take a mobile but they cannot use your sim and with this umts the mobile also uses the information of the sim card to also check that this uh, mobile is actually talking to a legitimate network along with security there is another important consideration in mobile cellular networks which is privacy now privacy because in wireless this is all happening wireless so whenever you are talking you are actually broadcasting to everyone 
So there may be some person who can eavesdrop, who can catch your signal, he can who can get the conversation. So in order to make this eavesdropping the conversation to catch difficult, there are cryptographic keys on the SIM card. These are used to encrypt the transmission. Encrypt, decrypt. That is crypto cryptography is used here. So this is how the privacy is ensured. Packet switching and circuit switching. So the networks, there are two types of network basically or the communication they follow. How the data flow, the routing it takes place. So it can be packet switch network, it can be circuit switched networks. And these packet and circuit, they have come from some background. Packet switch is connectionless, circuit switch is connection oriented. So in packet switching, every packet is routed independently of every other packet. So we have two messages here. They are taking different routes. Okay, for example, we have multiple routes, multiple path, multiple way. Because in between this A, B, C, D, E can be routers, it can be switch, it can be the different network devices, connections. So this message, let us assume that we have a packet. This message is a packet. Now this packet size is say 4000, 4000. Now we divided it into say 3000 or divided into three parts. Now there are three parts. Now the first part can take this, this path. It can be routed through the other one can be routed through this path and the other one can again take a different path. So every packet is routed. Route means the path it takes independent of every other packet. I'm not saying that they will, they all these three will not take us. They can also take a single path also. Now what is the, you know, benefit? If this C router goes down, I showed you two and three are going, they are, they have to go through C. Or they were going through C, but now when the system, some part goes down or the router goes down, the packet switching system will dynamically reconfigure itself so that the next packet, that is if two and three were supposed to go through C and C is down, then the packets can take different routes. That is they can take this way or they can take this way, the other subsequent packets. Ultimately they have to reach destination. There is one more thing here that if too many packets, they swamp, they flood the router. No, it can choke the router. So what will happen? The packet will be lost. The router will be or the networking devices will be losing or, or dropping the packets. This is losing of packet and this happens in packet switching. You can call it as swamping, flooding, choking. This all results in losing of packet. This happens in packet switching. Circuit switching, it doesn't happen. Right? We'll take, take the differences also. A short diff, uh, way of discussing these two. So the sender will notice and reset. But the quality of service can be poor because you don't know or there has to be some way, it has to be accounted which packet was dropped, which wasn't. So the quality of service of packet switching is not as compared to the circuit switch networks. For example, you're sending an image. Now you're sending it using packets, a message. Now the I or no, this packet is lost. How do you see yourself at the destination? Now the other counterpart is circuit switching. It has come from telephone systems. Normally in telephone system, there are two parties. One is the caller, callee. So two parties, one calling, one attending. Now when you, you know, pick up the cradle, you dial the number and then the call, the other person will listen to some ring. And when he picks up the call, both of them picks up the call. Now a permanent connection is established. 
right? A permanent connection is established, and this is the single root I'm talking about. And this root or route or connection will be maintained until the call is terminated by either of these two. Now, what happens when the lies, the line or the switch or the you know some networking devices goes down? The call will be aborted. So there is a circuit. How does this circuit form? One is calling, one is one is replying. So there is a kind of circuit being formed. That is why this is called circuit switching. The call has to be aborted if something goes down in between. Therefore, circuit switching is less fault tolerant than the packet switching. Okay, packet switching is all about taking different path. If even if there is some fault, it can tolerate it. The packets can take another part, another route, right? But here, there is no other path, a single path. So circuit switching, because what is the benefit? First of all, there is a single path always established. So the quality of service, it can support easily. Because when the connection is being established, you know in advance. So we can, the communication network or the subnet can reserve the bandwidth, link bandwidth. It can also, you know, switch the buffer spaces. Also the CPU time, this all comes under the quality of service. And for example, the resources are not sufficient. If you know that there is a call already being established, then what will happen? If previously, when you we used to call, you know, 10 years back, after 11 o'clock, the calls were free. So everyone starts calling. And when we start calling, it is always busy. But once the connection is set up, the connection of circuit switching will give you a good service. So here, once you make a connection in circuit switching, if the packets or the path of or the route will always be the same for all the packets. There are equipments which we see today in the core network. Both are packet also and circuit switch equipment also. You know, mo mostly the core networks they are still using the packet and the circuit switch equipment both. They, these are not different networks. The, the network or the communication medium, they have the say merging of this packet and circuit switched network. Uh, the older mobile phone networks, they used to have this circuit switched core network because they were carrying the uh, voice calls. I'm talking about the 1G systems. But that legacy, that tradition is still seen in the latest 4G, 5G network, UMTS, UCMSC, Mobile Switching Center, all I have tried to show here. Show here. So MSC, uh, Mobile Switching Center, then we have GMSC, that is Gateway Mobile Switching Center. Then we will also see the Media Gateway, MGW. These are there for switch service. These are actually the, the switch circuit switched core network like previously in PSTN public switched telephone network like the BSNLs we have. So still we have the combination of these two. Okay. So circuit switch is still there. Packet is also there. What are the differences between a circuit switching network and the packet switching network? How the connection will be established? Circuit switching is the connection oriented. Packet switching is connection less. Packet switching is unreliable. Circuit switching is reliable. How? See, in circuit switching, when you call, there is a permanent route established. That is the physical path between source and destination is established. So this is the physical path when you are using a circuit switching network. While you are using a packet switching network, there will be no permanent path for the packets. One packet, the other packet, they may take different route. They can take different path. The ultimate thing is 
they have to reach at the destination. No matter, they take the path independently. In circuit switch, if something breaks, the connection breaks. But here, in the packet switching, if some portion goes down, then also the packets will reach, they will take a different route. In circuit switching, because the permanent uh, path is established, so that we can reserve the entire bandwidth in advance, right? The different, because the circuit switching, we know in advance, but the packet switching, this bandwidth is not reserved. So the packets use the same path in circuit switching, they packets travel independently and when it comes to the bandwidth, which comes under the purview of quality of service, we can reserve the entire bandwidth in advance. As I said, packet switching, we cannot reserve because different links can be established, different route can be taken for independent packets, right? Now, the other difference between circuit switching and packet switching is the bandwidth wastage and packet switching there is no bandwidth wastage. Bandwidth, you can uh, think of a pipe. How uh, the how much the width of the pipe is that decides the bandwidth. So bandwidth is wasted in circuit switching, not in packet switching. In circuit switching, there is no store and forward transmission packet switching. We have su it supports store and forward transmission. Now in circuit switching, once you establish a path, there is no need to store. The packets have to take the same path every time. But in packet switching, first it has to go here. Now it has to look for the path. It has to decide the route. There are routing algorithms. So if some of the link is broken, the packets may take different path. So it has to come and then it has to go. So it has the packet switching support the store and forward transmission. There are various generations of mobile telecommunication or you can say mobile networks or mobile services, cellular services, data services. These are different generations. 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. So the first generation was mobile phone system only transmitting the voice calls. There will be only, there was only analog signals, no digital, no bits. Now you see here AMPS, Advanced Mobile Phone System. This was deployed in United States in 1982 and it was the widely used first generation system 1G. This G stands for generation. Second generation, now it switched to transmitting voice calls in digital form. Okay. Now digital came here. This was to increase the capacity, to improve the security and then the text messaging was offered, texting. Then GSM, this GSM is actually a 2G system, global system for mobile communication and this was deployed in 1991, 1G 1982, 2G 1991. So this, this is I am showing how the phone used to look. 3G, this was initially deployed in 2001. And now it was giving both the voice and the data services digital. This digital voice and broadband digital services. So ITU, International Telecommunication Union, they have specified 3G that if you are standing, you must get at least 2 Mbps. And if you are moving, walking or in your train, you must get at least 384 kilobit per second. Mbps is megabit per second. This has to be the speed to call it as a 3G. And then UMTS, see in between 2G and 3G there, was, there is a time. So the CDMA1 and GPRS, they all come in 2.5G. G. We don't generally talk about 2.5G, but you need to know that there was 2.5G also. Some people have, uh, you know, they have researched on it. They have talked about it. So this UMTS is the main 3G system, which was deployed worldwide. And as we take the example of YouTube, say, there is some upload and there is some download. So this kind of thing you can think, think that there is a downlink, downlink speed 14, 14 Mbps uplink 6 Mbps. 
Now there is a spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, and there is a radio spectrum. So radio spectrum. Now for the three G system, the spectrum or the frequency range is very scarce, is very short. Now why it is related? Because you need to talk on certain frequency. You can only talk on certain frequency. So mainly in the mobile telecommunication, you ought to use the frequency. Okay. Now this frequency of band, this is governed by the you know federal government. Like that is the government has all the right. They sell it that this is the range, and if you want to take this range, give us this money. So if you have a spectrum part that is a licensed spectrum, so it becomes very easy to make systems and design systems according to it, because at that particular uh, spectrum, if you have purchased that spectrum, that is the frequency range. Then you can make your own uh, apparatus, uh, you know, design and operate the systems. But this costs a lot. This costs a serious money. Let me take you to 2000 in United Kingdom. Five 3G licenses. They were auctioned by the government for 40 billion dollar. I am talking about 2000. We are in 2022. So because of the scarcity of the spectrum, it, we have to do certain thing. So then came the cellular network. The cellular network has come just because of the scarcity of spectrum. There has to do be done something to reuse the frequency. Okay, because if you somebody is talking and if other person is also talking same frequency, there will be interference. And that interference, how to avoid that? So the coverage area of that base station was divided into certain cells. So if the division is such that there is a proper arrangement so that the uh, two people talking may not interfere or they may reuse the frequency. Okay. So within a cell, a user are assigned channels. For example, this A I am showing. All the A which you see here, they are in the same coverage area, but they 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 do not interfere with each other and not also with the adjacent cells. These two, when they are talking, they don't interfere. So this is allowing this way of uh, reusing or cellular network dividing into cell resulted in the frequency reuse in the neighboring cells, and this is how. the capacity of the network with a same frequency has increased was increased so this is the latest arrangement which we use frequency you reuse is a very important aspect in cellular network along with this the usage of different kind of antennas like directional antenna like sectored antennas on the cell towers this also helped in reducing the interference further So these are the all the way how we use these different G systems and frequency reuse. 4G and 5G. These are the four generation and five generation system. Why we are just uh, discussing them differently? Because now we are only talking about the data. That is, the voice is also now on data. That is the 4G. it was basically uh, 4g lte which actually became popular the long term evolution this lte 4g offers faster speed and this came up uh, in the late 2000s and at that time various technologies were there but when this 4g lte networks they came they for the mobile internet especially They outspace the WiMAX, which was eight zero two point one six. WiMAX was a very popular technology, technique, but it was overthrown by this four G LTE. And five G technologies, they are promising speed of ten Gbps. And they two thousand twenties, many countries got it, and it's still under set deployment. Four G it uses frequency bands up to twenty megahertz. But 5G, they are designed to operate in much higher frequency ranges or bands, up to six gigahertz. See, 20 megahertz 
we are talking about 6 gigahertz that is a very this 6 gigahertz that is a high frequency now what are the challenges high frequency means lot of attenuation lot of interference because of this new algorithms are make, being made the technology are being uh, you know emancipated that is uh, say MIMO multiple input multiple output antenna arrays have come up and the thing is that these short microwaves of this kind this range of frequencies they are easily absorbed by rain so this is also one of the challenge which the designers are experiencing and working on